Hello, space junkies, and welcome to What a Piece of Junk, the Star Wars podcast here on the Fandom Podcast Network. I'm your agreeable host, Scott Botman, and joining me for this episode 123 is my original podcast co-pilot, Mr. Derek Marsh. Derek, welcome back to the show. How's it going, bud? It's been going good. It feels good to get back into the ship here. I've uh, been taking a bit of a summer break, plus just the timing of things just seemed to not work out every time we wanted to yeah. Yeah. podcast report something. So, um, yeah, so a little not quite rusty. Uh, I did a uh, recording um, with one of our fellow Star Trek or not Star Trek, Star Wars CCG uh, Facebookers um, who puts some of the YouTube co uh, content out there. Um, so did some stuff with him a couple of weeks ago. It hasn't aired yet. He's got a huge backlog of stuff. So hopefully by the end of August, um, I will have my stuff out there to talk. Um, and I can always put a link in. I did plug in for the show. So there Sweet. we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, no, it's good to be back in uh, our exciting times because in Aaron, a few weeks, we're going to have uh, quite a bit to talk about with uh, Ahsoka dropping. So that's right. And so tonight's episode of this podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about Ahsoka as a character, her genesis, her origin, if you will, uh, where she started, where she's been, where we think she's going. Uh, and of course, we cannot talk about Ahsoka unless we talk about her creator, Mr. Dave Filoni. And we can't talk about Dave Filoni on this show unless we get our own Dave Phil Cloney, my original Wookiee co-pilot, uh, our very own Gooey Chewy, the man of a thousand nicknames mr nathan miracle nathan how are you over there in the queen city i am uh under the weather uh, quite literally uh so if i cut in or out it's because there's a massive thunderstorm rolling through uh yeah i feel fine but the weather itself very bad uh, so i do apologize in advance for any technical difficulties but other than that i'm doing great i'm looking forward to later this month August 23rd, it's so tantalizingly close. Ah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. Um, I've been a huge fan of Ahsoka probably since round about the third or fourth season of Clone Wars. I'm not going to be one of these uh, fair weather <laughs> fans where I act like I, oh, I loved Ahsoka from the beginning. I, I didn't. I'm not going to lie about that. I, I At first I was all, oh my God, we're just making a play for the tween girls and the, you know, she's got the midriff thing and she's calling Anakin Skywalker Sky Guy. I'm not sure I can handle this. Um, but, you know, I did take my youngest son, Matthew, to see the Clone Wars film in theaters uh, when it first came out. Because at the time, I thought that was going to be the only Star Wars movie released in a theater for its premiere that I could actually take one of my children to see. Um, I always assumed that I could take them to see some sort of re-release of episodes one, two, three, or four, five, six. Uh, you know, hopefully at least I would have would been able to take them to some sort of re-release for episode four. But this was long before we ever had the possibility of new episodes of Star Wars. And then, of course, you know, non-episodic Star Wars films and now streaming series. I mean, my kids have probably seen more Star Wars by their current ages than I had seen when I was their current ages. And that was really rewatching the original trilogy numerous times. <laughs> That's right. So if you're going to. Yeah, yeah. And if you're going to just say only first runs, um, they've seen like 500,000 times more Star Wars than I had at their respective ages right now let's see when i was matthew's age and i was 22 years old in 1999 uh and so my my birthday is may the 19th so right at that time i had seen the phantom minutes which was the first new star wars in you know ages at that moment uh prior to that the only <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Uh, prior to that, the uh, the only new Star Wars content I ever had the chance to watch after Return of the Jedi was um, either something video game wise, which for a lot of people doesn't count or certainly didn't count in the 1980s or droids and or Ewoks, uh, you know, cartoon series or, of course, our friend friend of the show, Eric Walker. I could watch him over and over on my recorded from ABC VHS of the Ewok movies. So cool. You know, I actually got the chance to see Star Wars A New Hope in a theater, um, not a movie theater necessarily, but a theater. Um, I also have a new job. I'm still working for a municipality, just a different one. Uh, and this particular one has a theater uh, that they run and they showed Star Wars 
on the big screen, but it was a, a projector screen, not a to which I guess I mean regular movie theaters are projectors too, but um, it, it was different. And uh, part part <laughs> part way through, it, it felt like somebody was just projecting something on their wall, yeah. You know? Um, ah, because yes, th okay. this theater is made for like a, a band to come play, you know, it, it has a stage and whatnot. So there's a big yeah, screen perhaps on the Dolby stage. Dolby digital surround sound is what you're yeah. trying to say. <laughs> it's more the case for like drama or you know live yes. theater in the yes. uh, you know the way of actors on stage. Yes, actors. Um, but they they were, they were doing a, a summer series and and they had Star Wars as one of them. Um, so I went and watched that and um, before the movie i gave uh, my girlfriend andrea a list of things to watch out for to see which version of a new hope it was so i was really <laughs> really hoping that it would not even say a new hope that they would somehow have gone back to the original yeah but that that wasn't it um and about three or four minutes in i thought this is definitely at least special edition um, you could tell immediately because the star destroyer is so super fast um, yeah, the speed it but, is sped up. Yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, but also, um, once we got to Greedo, he said McClunky. So I'm like, yeah, th this is actually <laughs> this is actually the most recent. They they basically got Disney Plus and projected it up on yeah. the screen. Yeah, <laughs> like I could have done that at home, but uh, yeah. but still, it was neat to be able to go see it in a theater setting, surrounded by a whole bunch of other fans. Did you make any new? Did friends? you? Not a one. <laughs> Didn't talk to You're anybody. A typical Star Wars nerd. Don't talk to anyone. Did you? Did you have popcorn? Uh, there was popcorn there, but uh, but we had just eaten, so I did not partake of any popcorn there. Yeah. Well, at least it was there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it was. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump into talking about Ahsoka as a character. So I shared my story about taking Matthew to see Ahsoka's premiere on the big screen uh, where we saw the original Star Wars uh, Clone Wars movie. Um, Derek, uh, what was your first encounter with Ahsoka as a character? Did you watch that movie? Did you go to the theater? Did you watch it on TV later? Uh, when did it come out? 2004, 2007, right? Um we lost Oops, Nathan. Sorry, Nathan. <laughs> sorry. Technical <laughs> technical difficulties. Wait, we'll blame it, it on even Nathan's fault this time. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say we'll blame it on the storm. I was going to give you an out, but uh, oh well. Yeah, I mean that's absolutely what happened. Yes, I didn't push the wrong we're... button. <laughs> but anyway, they, yes, go ahead. Like two thousand four, two thousand. I'll look up the um the the Google machine here yeah. to see the release date. Anyways, I want to say it was like two thousand and five. Anyway, maybe. Anyways, I did not ever see it in, uh, eight. in the movie theme. Two thousand eight. Wow. Oh, okay, yeah, we were we were a okay. little too early there. So, so yeah. um, yeah. So I never I never watched it. Um, actually, at the theater, um, I had seen you know previews for it and whatnot, but I could tell from the previews it was really like a kids movie, right? Mm -hmm. And I was just like, and eh, not interested in it, right? Because I mean, I was working crazy hours at that time still and dealing with um, master classes for my MBA. So I just didn't make the time for it. But then uh, 2009, right, is when um, we had the um, Adult Swim Clone Wars, right, came out. Mm -hmm. um, Starkowski yeah. stuff. So we had that. Um, and, uh, you know, but that was obviously more with that. No, sorry. I mean, there was a we got... We got them flip-flopped. 03 was the Tartakovsky series on, on Cartoon Network. Uh, well, that's I right. mean, they've they've shown it on Cartoon Network several yeah. times, but the premiere was 03, yeah. Yeah, okay. But that's probably when I would have watched it, though, because um, 2003 was college, and I don't remember seeing it um, mm. at that time. But it would have been afterwards, because then I think they showed it before the animation, like the CGI animation version was airing. So they played that again. Um, because they didn't play it for a while, I recall, after that. Like, once the CGI right. version came out, they didn't do any of the other ver uh, version for quite a while. Um, but there were a couple of times that Cartoon Network took the Tartakovsky series and finally stitched it all together and showed it, yeah. like, all at once. Because the yeah. original release of the Tartakovsky series was at, like, three minutes or so apiece for, yeah. <laughs> for each episode. It's like in between, like, Although, on a commercial. 
between episodes. Yeah, yeah. We never really got to Although, see Nathan, like... didn't we research this one time and a couple of those Clone Wars episodes from Tartakovsky were at like six or even 15 minutes, right? Wasn't that right? Uh, some of them, I believe the ones that are in what's listed as the second season on Disney Plus were longer. Yeah. Uh, the original ones were like literally they were made for this episode of whatever is going off this other show is coming on yeah, and in between. In, in between here's three minutes of star wars yeah. yeah 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 so that's pretty that's for sure why i didn't even watch it when it first aired but anyways so that was um not much um so like i said i caught that and obviously there's a little bit there but i didn't i have any of the background at that time either from the the movie and then the show came out and i watched most of the first season um but then like everything else i was just consumed with other things at my lot in life and again i thought it was more of a kid show and i'm gonna i'll be honest i mean season one is a bit rough just like most <laughs> shows are plus like most season ones yeah right yeah, yeah. most season ones of most shows it's pretty rough plus again the out of sync or the out of order of how things were kind of was like eh. it wasn't i mean so bad i feel like season two was a bit worse than season one with that um but overall though like i said season one so i i'll be honest i didn't do much ahsoka um so really when she came out when i got heavily invested with rebels and she came in season two i was like oh dang okay so she's fulcrum she's really you know i knew a bit of her but other than people cosplaying her and she popped up in the card game um you know from um fantasy flights original um lcg at the time um i didn't know much anything else about her but i was like okay this is cool so that's actually what prompted me then to go back and watch the original season or seasons i should say up to that point of clone wars which was before then we got season six and then before we got season the ultimate season seven so um but once i got into the actual watching of her and all that that's when I really started to like her to your point, Scott, right later on mm -hmm. um, when she really started to kind of grow up. Right. They didn't treat yeah. her just as a true Padawan. Um, and then really, I mean, she just became a, a fan favorite or beloved for me, especially when you got the later portions and she really started to challenge the Jedi Council. And then ultimately when she left it, it was just like, OK, this character is really cool um hopefully we'll get more of her sometime down the line and obviously you know and then obviously because you only get the bit in um at the time season two of rebels we didn't know what was going to happen with her until season four when we get some more but even then it's still unresolved right so until the end so yeah yeah nathan well, did you see the clone wars movie in theater or how was your first introduction to ahsoka uh i did not I actually was a bit of a latecomer for a variety of reasons one i did think oh this is a kid's show uh i i don't necessarily need to pay attention to this uh so i didn't go seek out the clone wars for a little while also uh, at the time that clone wars came out i was going through some uh job things <laughs> uh, i owned a game store for a little while lots of fun not lots of money so i didn't have cable for a good long while yeah. uh, which meant i couldn't turn on cartoon network and watch clone wars otherwise i probably would have just because it was star wars but you know once it had aired i didn't necessarily go try to find it until later it came on netflix um, and once that happened, uh, Scott, actually, you told me, oh, you should really watch Clone Wars. It's actually pretty good. And I had heard that Darth Maul had come back. I'm like, all right, can that really be all that good? Yes. Yes, it can. Yeah. Uh, if, if it's done well, it can be really good. Uh, and that that was done well. Uh, but Ahsoka wasn't really the reason that I watched Clone Wars to begin with. I knew by that time that she had become a fan favorite. So I had a bit of a weird experience of going back and watching the first episodes and going, why do people love this character right, yeah. so much? What is the deal? Yeah. Like, like, I mean, she's not terrible, but she's definitely like the Jar Jar Binks of this show. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind the fact that actual Jar Jar shows up on the show yes yeah um but you know he's he's a great jedi who commands fish at least yeah. in that one episode but uh 
but you know, obviously I continued watching the show and saw how she grew. So for me, it was a fairly short time period between this is an annoying teenage girl to, okay, no, now I see why uh, you know, the, the episodes that she's in tend to be my favorite episodes as we get to the later seasons. Not so much in, in the first few seasons. <laughs> But, right, you know, right. The, the character but, definitely grew and matured, and I think that was the point of the character. And it's an interesting point because for me, that was the same reason I was able to rewatch it. Right, was because of Netflix too, Nathan. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you think about that, at this point in time, Disney had, um, you know, acquired the property, but Netflix had put the money found founding uh, or put the money together so they could make a season six. So that mm-hmm. was the interesting thing, right? And, and to really be fair, I mean, without Netflix, there might not have been that interest that Disney had with Star Wars. Oh, definitely. Well, yeah, definitely. because without se- without season six, there would almost certainly not have been a season seven. Well, but to, to my um, point, though, that Netflix's numbers and interest in Clone Wars showed that i mean obviously there was money in star wars don't get me wrong but that might have helped disney decide to then purchase star wars because they right. knew yeah. that it had to have been a new factor. content out right so i never really thought about that but if we think about the kind of how the way that timeline works that without potentially netflix giving filoni that opportunity to get season six we might not have any star wars today or at least not what it is um, from a Disney perspective. Well, and we almost certainly wouldn't right. have had rebels uh, or right. if we did, it wouldn't have worked out the way it did. Well, yeah, yeah. that's what I was going to say. We certainly wouldn't have the foundation of Disney star Wars. That is star Wars rebels that we would have. And we mm-hmm. definitely wouldn't be getting ready to have an Ahsoka series in live action. If there had yeah. been no extra interest from Netflix and more clone wars, I think the character of Ahsoka probably would have sort of been, that's it. She'd become almost as apocryphal as, um, you know, Mace Tawani and those guys from the Ewok adventures, technically still canon, but not really impacting current Star Wars. Whereas now Ahsoka is about to be the name of the game, at least for the, you know, for the next few months. Um, which I think is great because I find the whole storyline that they've set up from Rebels with uh, the search for Ezra and working with Sabine and how the dark saber is connected to it all. I think that's very interesting. Which what's really fascinating about this idea of if we hadn't gotten that season six from Netflix, Ahsoka probably wouldn't be as big as she is now. She wasn't even in season six, right? Right, but it, it made people, correct. like you yeah, said, it no. made people go back and look at the other stuff. Yeah, yeah, like like the the rising tide lifted all boats, including Ahsoka's, who wasn't even in that season. Mm-hmm. But but there are things in that season that to really understand them, it helps to see the previous seasons, yeah. and to, and to, and she's almost conspicuous by her absence. The fact that she's not in season six makes you go, well, why isn't she in season six? And that brings you to the final episodes of season five, where you find out about her leaving the Jedi Order. And that raises lots and lots of questions that leads into Rebels and leads into the Ahsoka series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because if you go back to season six, it was really just the leftover episodes. I mean, it was unfinished right. stuff that they didn't yeah. just, you know, they were able to put, put it together. But again, my, my old premise was that without Netflix doing that, there might not be Disney and Star Wars is all I'm saying. Yeah. Totally. Well, totally. There, there might not be Disney Plus. Yeah. And well, I, obviously, I yeah, think, without Netflix, there would be no streaming, right? There. I think it would have been much better for all of the entertainment companies. Now, of course, you know, hindsight is... 50 50 wait no um hindsight is 2020 i think it would have been much better for many of today's entertainment companies if they had continued to let netflix and other companies like that do the streaming thing and they just make good content and license it out to them i think i saw somewhere recently where peacock the nbc based uh, streaming service Peacock. on which i watch tons and tons of wwe so wrestling. i subscribe to peacock um yeah gotta watch my wrestling um but that they lost out on five hundred million dollars when they refused to continue licensing the office to netflix and moved the office over to Peacock. And wow. I'm like, 
I wonder if they're going to make anywhere close to $500 million with Peacock. And the answer, of course, was at the time, no, but we'll build up our subscriber base and eventually we'll make a bunch of money with our own streaming service, which, of course, they're not doing. Not as many people use Peacock as ever use Netflix and probably never will use Peacock as much as many people use Netflix. Um, so that was a net loss for NBC. Yes, they get to keep the office in-house, which is where they wanted it, and they produced it, so it's their show. They can do what they want to with it, but they could have been better stewards of their content. And some days I feel like Disney's in the same boat. Keep licensing your Star Wars stuff and your Marvel stuff and your Muppet stuff to Netflix and make a bunch of money and don't have to pay all the massive streaming service overhead, blah, blah, blah. But greed is a powerful motivator. And this so, is part of what the whole actor strike is about. You know. So, so ironically, do you think that Disney will do the same thing that they did with all their gaming? Because that's what they used think, to do. They used to make their own gaming, right? Mm -hmm. I think they oh, might, yeah. at, after, the, after the strike is over... We might end up, I mean, one of the ways the strike might end is that companies like that stop having their own streaming service and go back to licensing it to Netflix. Although Disney Plus is probably big enough now and starting to do their own licensing deals that they might be one of the big three players. I think they'll be like three big streamers when it all shakes out. Well, well who, do you, who um, do you think? As we die, uh, digress. Oh, I think Netflix is, I think Netflix is going to survive yeah. because they have so much of their own thing. Well, and they've they been unique, doing it so Other long, than they keep right? canceling everything after two couple of seasons. Well, yeah. Um, and then I think Disney Plus is going to survive. And I think Paramount Plus is going to survive. And they're and amongst those, they're going to gobble up or license out all the stuff from Max, all the stuff from uh, 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 Peacock, uh, and all the stuff from Hulu, and so on and so forth. Um, because I think Hulu is actually going to get absolved or uh, uh, absorbed by Disney Plus since yeah, since Disney owns all that stuff already. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, I think uh, those will be the three that live. Apple, Apple will though too, because Apple is going to push itself into the sporting industry to do it. Yeah, we'll see how they. Plus, everybody has freaking Apple. You know, fifty percent of the world has Apple devices, yeah. right? So yeah, it, Apple TV might Apple TV might just absorb one of those other ones I was talking about, like Peacock or or uh, or whatever. HBO. So yeah, Ahsoka. Yeah. Anyways, yes, back yes, to sorry. Ahsoka. And we'll be using one of those streamers to watch Ahsoka. Uh, and speaking of watching <laughs> Guess Ahsoka, which one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And speaking of watching Ahsoka, let's talk a little bit about when the character was first introduced and, as a concept. So um, I'm going to answer my own question first here, and then we'll go around the horn. Uh, Anakin Skywalker getting a Padawan. First of all, did we think it was a good idea? Because that kind of breaks with Jedi tradition. And second of all, uh, do we think that that was you know, that it actually worked out okay? So a, I think it was a bad idea uh, in universe for Yoda and Obi Wan and them to be like, I know what we can do to help Anakin become more responsible. Let's give him a Padawan. That's like saying, well, my kid is very irresponsible and sleeps around with a lot of women, and he so just let's got give him another girl, kid. <laughs> he he just got this girl pregnant, but I'm hoping that that'll be good because becoming a father will make him have to be more responsible. Uh, uh, editor's note: My children do not do any of these things in real life. This is an example, um, but. If you've ever had a friend or known a kid who did that, becoming a father very rarely actually makes you become more responsible. We hope that that's what will happen every time one of our friends becomes a father. But, um, you know, it doesn't always do that, especially if you're in the midst of a very troubling time in your life when you unexpectedly become a father, right? Now, I realize that being a master for a Padawan is not the same as having a child. Um, but metaphorically speaking, you get the idea that Yoda and Obi-Wan and maybe some of the other Jedi Council members were like, this will help Anakin become more responsible and be more receptive to what it's like to actually be a you know member of the Jedi society and maybe someday groom him toward becoming a member of the Jedi Council since he's so strong in the Force and some of us believe he's an answer to prophecy. Um, I don't think that they really thought that through. They had a lot of hubris of thinking that they could make the decision for Anakin to be in charge of this little girl and that would somehow help him. But then again, that keeps with Lucas's theme of the Jedi Council was filled with its own hubris at that moment in time, at that epoch in the galactic history of the Republic. 
hey, Obi-Wan, Yoda, Mace Windu, all these jokers think they know what's best for everybody. And in this case, they think they know what's best for Anakin and they think they know what's best for Ahsoka. Um, so, yeah, I think it was a bad idea in universe and in the marketing arm of Lucasfilm at the time. I think it was a blatant play for getting girls, more girls interested in Star Wars at a time when Hollywood was just beginning to crest that wave of we should put lots of female main characters into properties that haven't traditionally had a lot of female representation. I have no problem with that idea. I really liked that idea when it came to, you know, having Rey be the main character of the sequel trilogy. Um, I think Ahsoka was both a little too far ahead of the curb. Um, but Lucas is always trying to push the envelope. So this was him doing that again. And B, I don't think she was executed originally as well as Ray had been done in episode seven. Um, and so the introduction was a lot more rocky than it was for later on Star Wars stories. Uh, but I think that they finished it out really well. Once Ahsoka, the character matured, she, I also feel like Ahsoka's audience had matured. And I feel like the writing behind her, maybe even the writers themselves, had matured and learned a lot about how to write this kind of character. Um, so it worked itself out, um, but I think it was a bad idea both in universe and in execution within the narrative at the beginning. Uh, Nathan, what are your thoughts about that question? Uh, pretty much what you said. <laughs> I, I, agree okay. with, I agree with... Uh, Pretty much everything you said, I do think it was in universe a terrible idea. Uh, even Anakin thinks when Ahsoka shows up that she's Obi Wan's new Padawan because hey, I'm a Jedi Knight now, so Obi Wan needs a new Padawan. Oh, just kidding! <laughs> this Padawan's for you. For you, <laughs> <laughs> like like you just became a Jedi Knight. Uh, we're definitely not conferring the title of Master on you. But we are making you this Padawan's master. Mm -hmm. um, so that to me was weird from a, a not in universe standpoint. Like it is a plot point that Anakin is not a master. And yet he sort of is a ma he is a master of a Padawan, but not a Jedi master. Yeah. Uh, which which that uh still seems a little odd to me. But I got over that part, but I, I think you make a good point about the writers maturing and figuring out, okay, how do we write this character? I think part of it is they started off with, well, how do we write a girl Jedi? Right. And they eventually learned, no, no, what we need to do is write a good Jedi who happens to be female, not right. a female character who happens to be force sensitive. Derek, what are your thoughts about that question? Ahsoka's introduction was, the, you know, the her being yeah. a Padawan for Anakin Skywalker. So uh, I actually uh, I'm uh, arguing against both of you. So the first thing is, I think it was, um, well, I shouldn't say it wasn't a bad idea for him to get a Padawan. I, I, we all agree that, you know, Anakin should have never been given anything, other, not even a, a freaking pen, right? <laughs> not, um, not even a lightsaber, quite frankly. Yeah, to be fair, yeah, <laughs> so how many times he's lost that. But I think it honestly was pushed by them uh, because they needed more Jedi for the war. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's yes, the that whole reason true. they really did it, right? And yeah, desperate it, times, desperate measures. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they were just trying to fill in. Okay, when the next Jedi dies, then you know, here we go, ready somebody to promote them to whatever you know, lieutenant or colonel or captain, whatever they want to call them. Right? That wasn't because, especially at that time, they didn't really. I mean. The clones were there and they were obviously very military trained, but the Jedi didn't trust them enough to, you know, become friends like we do later in the seasons. Right. You know, right. Right. Um, they're just treating them as pure infantry. Right. And, and disposable um, resources. So kind of like they treat them towards the end. Right. Um, so <clears throat> the um, but the way I, I I've interpreted it um, from a plot point of of what ahsoka is and and what she's become i i'm not arguing one bit that they wanted to attract the female audience so i i'm not denying that but i look at it that again i know season one's a bit rough around the edges but i think that was just because again they were trying to develop the characters trying to put stuff in they were trying to get where they were going with it right they didn't really have a true story like like i said most season ones end up 
being, right? And I look at it though that if you look at the way the character is, though, like she is like a 13, 14 year old teenager girl. Yeah, um, yeah. She she is constantly bickering with a person, to be honest, that's not that much older than her, right? I mean, Anakin at that time is what, 19? Um, yeah, it you know, was so less master uh, mentor apprentice, bigger more, brother, little sister, big brother. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, but, which was exactly the problem that Anakin had with Obi Wan because they also had more of a sibling relationship, correct? Than master apprentice. Well, and again, that's where we get that whole beautiful speech during the Mandalorian behind the scenes season one when Filoni goes into the whole point of Qui Gon and the fate of the universe and the duel of the fates, yeah. right? Yes, um, so. Um, and that was part of the downfall of Anakin, right? Um, that, <clears throat> well, we'll go into that. Well, that's another side story. We're going to try to stay on Ahsoka. Yeah, or else we'll, this will be a two hour podcast, not even talking right, about Ahsoka. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but no, I look at it though. Honestly, I, that's what I liked about Ahsoka though, that she was more human. That's why I don't like Ray, because by the end of episode seven, she can do everything already. She can jump a gazillion feet high. She can twirl a lightsaber and defeat a person who's at least been at this point trained by Luke Skywalker. Right. And she just, you know, manhandles him. Now, granted, he's got a wound in from a bow caster, but still. Right. And she but can mind read and all that stuff. So I, I just look at it that that's part of the reason that people like myself don't like the force fed female characters where they're just invincible to begin with, unless if it's like, you know, power girl or something where yeah that's the way they're made or or captain marvel right um but i look at it that's what i liked about ahsoka was that she did feel bumbling across like everyone else but she was just part of it right um i'm not saying that the writing was excellent season one but it made her feel like okay she's learning this as we go we got episodes like that right she made mistakes she screwed up right there were those moments between her and anakin where it's like yeah you know we both screwed up together or had you listened to me right like anakin's always 50 50 of whether <laughs> it always worked out for some reason right because it's the good <laughs> yes. guys but but whether yep. he got in trouble or not was always 50 50 but that's what i liked about it right and then yeah and then you get the excellent season three through five where she really starts to become her own. She, they really gave her a voice. Um, Ashley Eckstein, obviously, you know, a phenomenal voice actress for um, just in general, but with the Ahsoka character, right? It's great. So, um, you know, that's where I disagree. I, I think the fumbling of the writing of season one made her real more realistic because that's what they did with her. They they made her, uh, you know, a, a angry sometimes or bashful or unsure or, you know, just a 14-year-old girl, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, one of the reasons that we can see Ahsoka do a little more mistakes and learn from her mistakes is, of course, she had more time, like physical runtime, because well, uh, it was a series. Yeah. And of course, and now she's had years upon years of, of uh, adventures, as it were. Uh, and and, and more time the loop. And, yeah, yeah, honestly, really? yes. yeah. Okay, well, uh, okay, then. So last question, I think, for our Ahsoka discussion before we take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk a little more uh, Star Wars news. Or in this case, Star Wars list article. We have a top 10 characters in Star Wars with the highest kill counts. So that will be interesting. But for our third and final question about Ahsoka's uh, status as a character in Star Wars Galaxy, um, do we think that she has so far achieved enough to be up there with, you know, Anakin, Obi-Wan, Luke, those kinds of force users, or is she still kind of a B tier character, more like Din Djarin and, and, uh, and perhaps uh, Sabine and, and the rebels crew uh, so that it, she is poised to become big. If her series turns out well, Nathan. Uh, I think she is an A-list character. I think she's up there with Vader and Luke and the other main characters. She essentially is the main character of Star Wars outside of the Skywalker saga, mm. um, in my opinion. I mean, she spans several different uh, time eras because she's in the Clone Wars. She's also in the Galactic Civil War, and now she's beyond the Galactic Civil War. Um, and there's really not any other characters that have quite that time frame. Uh, even like Yoda 
as old as he is. We see him in the Republic and in the Galactic Civil War, and and then that's it. He passes he away. <laughs> he, he, he dies. Luke, uh, we see in the Galactic Civil War and in the sequels, but he wasn't around in, in the prequel era. So Ahsoka really kind of bridges all the different eras of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and like I said, outside of the Skywalker saga that she's just not in, um, she's kind of the the through thread. And I think that makes her an A-list character. I think the bigger risk is that if this uh, show doesn't do well, if it ends up being like Secret Invasion, where it's just not all that good, um, it could actually bring her stock down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope it's great. I hope it's everything we expect it to be and more. Uh, but there is the the potential risk of it just not going well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Derek, what do you think? Is Ahsoka already an A-lister or she's a B-lister that's on the cusp? Uh, she has to be l right now labeled as a B character simply for the fact is because as most casual fans, they don't know who she is. If you ask anyone who Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, Leia, Chewie, the droids, Darth Vader, um, you know, to a casual person walking on the street, they're going to know it's Star Wars, right? Um, people are going to be highly, hopefully, enticed to watch all of her stuff after the series. Whether they will or not, we don't know. Um, you know, the casual fan has had some slight introduction, obviously with the book of Boba and, and, you know, season, um, two of the Mandalorian and, and what we got with, um, her interaction with Grogu and Luke Skywalker. Um, but I don't know if it was enough to entice them to go back. Right. They're just like, okay, here's this character. She shows up. Um, you know, we get a little bit right that she's a Jedi, but then she says she's not a Jedi. So it just depends. Um, but from a Star Wars fan, I would absolutely say she is a, a tier A character. There's no doubt in my mind. If you think of anything outside, to Nathan's point, anything outside of the original trilogy, you you know, you might have a favorite section, right? The pre prequels, the sequels, the animation shows, whatever. But to be fair, I mean, to Nathan's point, she's touched every one of those outside of the, of the movies, right? Right, um, right. So... You know, as a Star Wars fan, any you know, a, a hardcore fan, we'll all definitely agree with Nathan 100% that she is a, a you know, a list character for sure. She is a main character. She's had, like I said, more screen time than anyone when you really think about it, right? So, yeah, yeah. I am, am going to push back a little bit and argue that at this point, even most casual fans know who Ahsoka is. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, we just talked about how uh, she came out in 2008, which was 15 years ago, which means yeah. a lot of uh, people who are Star Wars fans now kind of grew up with her. But also, uh, I went to the Lego store uh, the other day, and I was looking at the keychain aisle, and lo and behold... Hey. There's an Ahsoka keychain just hanging out there. She is so Star Wars, like she is front and center in things like keychains and the, yeah. the merch and the marketing. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna um break my own question here and say that she is a uh, B plus tier character in that she is right there about to break through because of things like Nathan just said with the keychain. However. I was at the Disney store a few years ago, back when we had Disney stores. Um, and oh, wow. uh, yeah, and um, I was talking to a guy about an Ahsoka t shirt that was on sale at the Disney store, and he was a, a Disney store employee. And when I came in, I was wearing my Rogue One t shirt, and he was like, Hey, great t shirt. I loved that movie. And I said, Yeah, I think the company's done a lot of great stuff now that Disney is in charge of Star Wars. And he's like, Yeah, me too. And I said, And I'm really excited about all the stuff going on with the Clone Wars season seven coming out. And he said, as a Disney store employee, oh, the cartoon stuff, I don't watch that. It doesn't count. And I was yep. like, really, dude, really? 
And there are too many fans who maybe they may even call themselves hardcore, lifelong Star Wars fans, but they don't watch the cartoon stuff. And if that's the case, even at this point, you're going to miss a whole bunch of Ahsoka. Uh, you've got some live action Ahsoka to watch right now. That's for sure. Um, but if you're one of those kinds of fans that, like Derek was saying, the movie stuff is the only stuff that matters to you, or in this case, the live action stuff is the only live stuff action. That matters to you, you don't know who she is um, much. Which is which is a, a shame for those fans, but there are more fans like that, I think, than we realize or that we even want to realize. I will tell um, you that's eighty percent, eighty percent of the I'm population sure. of population uh, of people that watch of watch Star Wars. I I can tell you right now, eighty percent do not watch the cartoons. Yeah, you know, I I think that probably was the case at a certain point in time, but if you think about it people who were 10 years old when Ahsoka was introduced, who were kind of the target market for the clone wars, they're, they're 25 now. So we, we've yeah. got adults who grew up with Ahsoka. So I don't think it's, yeah, but that's, quite again, the but that's a anymore. star. That's a star Wars hardcore person that watched. I, I, I don't not think a casual that, person. Mm -mm, no, I, <laughs> I disagree. I think if you're watching it at 10 years old, that doesn't necessarily make you a hardcore fan. Maybe so. Uh, although I like, will say that a lot of kids who were in that target demo didn't stick with star Wars and they transitioned over to Marvel. Right. But they would recognize Ahsoka. Mm. Maybe. Although I think to Derek's point, there are plenty of old people who are star Wars fans that love star yes. Wars and would tell you they do, but they wouldn't know who Ahsoka was. But I will tell you, people that are our age and younger, I'm just I'm just saying, you'd be amazed to your point, Scott. People will not watch the cartoons. That is a majority of the Star Wars viewer of the live action movies in that that are casual Star Wars fans. They yeah, won't, yeah. They won't know anything about Ahsoka other than what they people, see on Mando season two. Yeah. Casual fans our age and older, yeah, sure. But we have to realize that. You know, the number of people our age and older only goes down. It does not go <laughs> up. What, what are you trying to say, Nathan? <laughs> I'm trying to say, I'm trying to set a world record for oldest person in the world. I've been doing at this for like 39 years. When I started, I was terrible. I was like in seven billionth place, but, but I've leveled up a whole lot. <laughs> I'm halfway there. I'm like maybe in the three, three, three billion spot right now. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, my, my point is there's a lot of people who, you know, are adults now who have known Ahsoka. For, for them, Ahsoka has always been just as important to Star Wars as Luke Skywalker, even if they're not, not hardcore I'm not fans. That they're, I'm not denying that, but I... But I, I think you're overestimating how many people actually watch the Clone Wars as kids. Because one, it was Cartoon Network, so it's a niche market, anyways. Because to your point, like not everybody had cable even back then in 2009. Like it's still like not an, uh, again. The the common person will know because the way Star Wars transcends everything, right? You'll be like, oh yeah, I've seen the original movies or I've seen the sequel movies or whatever, and they'll be like, yeah, I'm a fan of Star Wars. Like I liked it, right? They'll say that, but they'll never watch anything on the Disney Plus streaming. They'll never watch the cartoons. They'll again, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, so I think what you're saying at that point. It's I, I would have to argue, like I said, nobody other than what's now coming out in the past three months, because obviously they're blaring the commercials out of it. Right. I, I think what you're saying is true for people who are as old as us. No, I don't I, think I, it holds true for the younger generation. We need well, to find we, some younger kids. Where's where's yeah. Matthew and Joseph? We need them to I'm do some even homework. Sure. <laughs> Do my kid do my kids count as younger kids now? They're both adults. <laughs> they would be ten. Well, yeah. Time. Well, yeah. That, that's well, what I'm yeah. saying. That, that's that's, that's the thing. The, the, the people who grew up with Ahsoka at this point have become adults. Not all of them, yeah. but a lot of them. But that's what we yeah. need Matthew and Joseph to do. They need to go out and say, "Okay, who of you knows about Star Wars?" And they'll be like, "Okay." And then the next question is, if "They know anything about Star Wars?" Because there's plenty of people that still have never watched a Star Wars movie, which astounds me. That's right? true. 
Um, yeah. And then you ask them, okay, do you like Star Wars? Yeah. Well, because if they don't say they like it because it's not their cup of tea, then they don't even bother. Then you can ask them, do you know who Ahsoka is? Um, okay. And that's fine because, again, the, she's been plastered all over the wall right now. She's commercial heavy. So there's a good chance that they might know who she is. And then do you say, is she up there with Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Darth Vader? Or, and, and Princess Leia? If they say yes, okay, fine. But I guarantee most of them will not say no. You know, the, you'll be lucky if they even get to question, th know who Soka is. Um, <laughs> you know, in, in I, Matthew I, and I, Joseph's demographic of their friends. I, I feel like in Matthew and Joseph's demographic, um, you would at times be lucky if they knew some of the other characters that we yeah, consider any listers. Um, yeah, uh, I do know that uh, Jonathan Davis, who is a friend of the show, been on to analyze soundtracks with us on episodes of What a Piece of Junk. Uh, his daughter, who is younger than Joseph, um, knows more about Clone Wars and the prequels than she does than about the original trilogy, of course. But even then, she knows about the sequel trilogy, which to me was amazing. But I was talking to Becca a, a few months ago, uh, and she was talking about how the original trilogy is kind of dated. She was like, it looks mm -hmm. like a clunky old movie. Um, to her, it's a clunky old movie. And she liked the prequels more so than she did the sequels because she felt like the the uh, the story was more interesting to her. And that's fine, but does she know who Ahsoka is, though, because she's watched the Clone Wars, or did she only watch the prequel movies, is what I'm saying. <laughs> no, she knows who Ahsoka is because she okay. watched the Clone Wars. Okay, yeah. fair enough then, right? Um, but that, now, that's, again, I, that's fine if she's watched But it, I'm not right? trying to say that she necessarily thinks Ahsoka is as big of a character as Anakin, let's or say. Padme, because for yeah. her, yeah. or Padme, right, right. You know, so, anyway... So. But definitely to, to to Nathan's point, certain people in, in much younger demographics, the original trilogy characters don't have any real meaning to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they know that Darth Vader is what happens to Anakin, but, you know, that's about it. You know? it it's the like same thing that applies to Star Trek. Yeah, because like we think Kirk, mm -hmm. Spock and McCoy are the archetypes and they are. But for some people, actually for more, I would say the majority of Star Trek fans today, the archetypes are Picard, Data, and Riker, you know, not uh, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Correct. Or maybe the archetypes are um, Captain Archer and his crew. Uh, because the, I would say Voyager, you know, right, with Janeway in there. Or maybe, yeah, or maybe I Voyager, think, right. You know, I, I, I would I would go with uh, Picard, Riker, and Data in part because, um, but delving into Star Trek a little bit here, in a recent episode of Strange New Worlds, uh, where they had the crossover with Lower Decks, one of the Lower Decks characters referenced Riker. And that was the whole reference, just said Riker. Well, they as did Warp, step, too. Stepped over. Like some, yes. Yeah. So, you know, they've, <laughs> yeah. Um, which only makes sense if the next generation are the archetypes. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're kind of getting a rewritten Spock and a rewritten Kirk as well. You know, good a whole rewritten everything right now. <laughs> uh, that's, that's true. But you know what? Ahsoka. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Okay, well, so that was our um, analysis of Ahsoka's position in why the she's Star important. Wars galaxy, why she's important, where she's been, where she came from, and uh, where she's going. Um, real quick, because we want to take a, then we want to take a, a short break. Uh, Nathan, where is she going? What's happening in the Ahsoka series? We sort of did our prediction episode already, um, but uh, we can do some last minute predictions because you know we've had a few snippets here and there of extra footage for the series before it has come out yet. Uh, so Nathan, where's she going? Uh, she's going to confront Grand Admiral Thrawn. I think they will have their meeting and I'm still on board for taking a lot of the plot points from the uh, Heir to the Empire trilogy. Uh, I yeah. think we'll get to Mount Tantus, that sort of thing. Um, at some point, there will be a clone fighting a clone. <laughs> or a clone fighting the original. It's Ezra. Yeah, I, I think it might be Ezra with with a Ezra. A a Ezra. Ezra. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that's a strong possibility. Um, but in, in that case, um, she might even play kind of the Mara Jade role. Uh, uh, the, the character who does already know how to use the Force, but... Um, isn't she was side eyeing Luke there in that season two point five there, Boba Fett she, a couple times. She so. was. Um, 
But we'll we'll see. Mm. See, in my opinion, okay, I'm gonna I'll go next to Derek. We'll let you close it out. Um, I think that where is she going? She is going to help start a whole new Jedi Order, but this time we're gonna do it right. Uh, that's why we saw Huang uh and the uh the lightsaber building droid there uh in the trailer for Ahsoka. Um, and uh, I think that she is going to be all about finding your own way and not being so locked down into the way that Yoda and Mason then were doing the Jedi religion, if you will, uh, at the end of the Republic there during the prequel era. Uh, and so I think she's going to be a, a shining beacon of this is how we should do it uh, so that Luke will try to emulate her more for a little bit. And then he'll sort of fall back into the ways of the Jedi, which was what leads us to, to his downfall or his resurrection, if you will, in The Last Jedi. Um, it leads us to the downfall with Kylo Ren smashing up the, the Jedi school. Um, but before that happens, I think Ahsoka is going to have a big formative influence on how Luke goes about trying to relaunch the Jedi Order. Um, but I think she will also try to be the one to teach him, whether, you know, advertently or inadvertently, directly or indirectly, she will teach him that lesson about to say that if the Jedi die, the light dies with them is arrogance. Um, because she's been on that side of, I'm on the light side, but I'm no Jedi, uh, multiple times in her life so far. Uh, and I think that she will continue to try to teach that lesson to people. But, you know, Nathan, you were talking about um, she might be playing kind of a Mara Jade role, or sorry, Derek was saying she might be playing kind of a Mara Jade role in the whole heir to the empire thing. Um, or both that, of you guys. That, were that was... Yes. Somebody just said that. Um, and I think actually she's more likely to play one of the characters. Like, I think the Ahsoka series where we're doing this heir to the empire storyline might end up being, that's when we see her meet her end. That she'll be one of the, she'll be a character that makes a sacrifice play during the heir to the empire uh, series. Um, but not I'm not yet. exactly sure how she's gonna go out a blaze of glory during the movie. During the movie, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that if there is gonna be a Mara Jade, Luke Skywalker, blah 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 thing, it actually won't be between Mara and Luke. It'll be between Sabine and Ezra. Um, for in, in yeah. some way, yeah. Um, I guess what I mean by a Mara Jade type is not the relationship with Luke, but the fact that she already knows how to use the Force and Mara Jade. Hmm knew how to use the force that's true um although marjade was specifically on a planet where they had a bunch of beings suppressing the force so that she wouldn't have to feel the force which luke ended up doing something similar hmm mm -hmm. we should have a podcast about that someday yeah yeah <laughs> after the ahsoka series is done we should definitely do a let's compare it to Timothy Zahn's original heir to the empire story, which of course has had to go through would have to go through numerous changes to fit into current star Wars canon. But that's yeah. also a whole different episode. The, the big one being uh, his clone wars involve cloning Jedi. <laughs> yeah. um, not, his clone wars involve cloning more than one person. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right, Derek. Take it on home for us. Where well, is Ahsoka real, going? Real quick, we we might get more than one season of Ahsoka. That's true. We might, yeah. Because Rosario yeah. Dawson has actually come out and she stated that if if the fans received this well, you know, or the if the show's received well by fans, there's a good chance they could get a season two. But it obviously depends on fan reaction, right? So and of course it depends on ratings and numbers and, and yeah. the actors' strike. Let's be honest, the whole yeah. Hollywood strike. Thing well, is... that that'll have to get resolved at some point because otherwise we'll never have movies again, right? And I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but um, we could have a whole other podcast on that too, and we'll have to get Lee in if he decides to join. So, anyways, <laughs> yes. um, so I think Ahsoka is not going to be looking for more Jedi. She's going to be looking strictly for Ezra. Um, I think she's not going to want to train Jedi because she's already had that conversation with Luke. And I think what preempted that was her relationship with Sabine. And that's why there's some of the stuff we've already seen um, with um, between Sabine and Ahsoka in the trailers of previous mentor and all uh, and padawan type deal and because of that fallout ahsoka's realized i'm not the 
mentor type. So she's not going to do it. So she knows what's going on with Thrawn and Emperor Palpatine. And that's why they have Ezra because basically Ezra is going to be Luke and what they're doing with everything yeah. there. So she needs to save Ezra. So I, or I, I'm not saying that she knows it's Palp, but she knows that the empire is doing something with cloning Jedi. And that's why she needs to save Ezra and stop Thrawn. Um, so that's really going to be what we're going to have in this season. Um, I think what we have with um, the two Inquisitors um, is basically just a side plot to basically big a big reveal towards the end. Um, now, I'm guessing Thrawn will be our big baddie, like we've talked about previously, um, for the next several seasons of live action shows in the movie. And I do think at some point, yeah, Ahsoka will bite the dust. Um and then that might even be again what pushes Luke to to your point, the last Jedi, right? That you know she sacrifices herself um, for something he did. Maybe I don't know. That'd be great. I mean, my question to you guys is: Do you think we'll get a Mark Hamill cameo for Luke Skywalker um, or not? Because you know that to me would be the the more interesting, shocking revelation. Or actually, really, I should say any of the the cast of any point, even if it is CGI with. Carrie Fisher's face on it. I'm going to take the really long shot odds here and say that we will get a Mark Hamill cameo, but it will not be Luke Skywalker. <laughs> he'll be voicing someone. Yes. Yeah. He'll be voicing somebody or he'll be under heavy makeup. And like three months later, it'll come out that, Hey, you remember that one alien in that one scene who was at the bar drinking that blue milk? The reason it was blue milk <laughs> is because that was Mark Hamill. <laughs> I'm going to say no to the Mark Hamill cameo. No to the Carrie Fisher cameo. Yes. Harrison Ford cameo because it was cheaper since they already had software de-aged Harrison Ford files on hand from, from Indy Jones. Jones of the yeah, that, that's Destiny. true. Let's just Photoshop him as young Indy or young Harrison into the scene and have it be slightly older. Han Solo is talking to, I don't know, Sabine or somebody or oh, no Hera. Yes. Hera is going to look for um, information about how to find Ezra. And one of the people she talks to is her old smuggler contact Han freaking solo but and, wouldn't she actually have a better contact with lando and yeah, uh, yeah. so hey a, a but but in that but if we do that it's not going to be cgi billy d it's going to be aged up donald glover well if they do the harrison ford thing bonus points if there's a lightsaber involved and he points out that it belongs in a museum <laughs> <laughs> yes so. Well, anywho, if any of those things happen, we'll certainly talk about them on our show. And people might be talking about them on the Fandom Podcast Network on other podcasts. To tell you all about those other podcasts, let's take a break and let Kevin fill you in. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. Here are the other great shows on the Fandom Podcast Network. Culture Clash, where we discuss the latest in entertainment and pop culture. Blood of Kings, our show covering the entire Highlander universe. Couch Potato Theater, we celebrate our favorite movies. And Time Warp, our fandom flashback show discussing a year in movies and our favorite retro movie, TV, and pop culture topics. Good evening, discussing all things Alfred Hitchcock. Hair Metal Podcast, we cover the rock metal music of the 80s and early 90s. Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast, discussing the time-traveling Doctor Who universe. Lethal Mullet, an action film podcast, covering the 80s, 90s, and beyond. Also, check out the Lethal Mullet Network for more great podcasts. What a Piece of Junk, our Star Wars podcast. Making Treks, a Star Trek podcast, with a deep dive into the final frontier. The Fandom Show, our Fandom Podcast Network live YouTube show discussing the hottest topics in fandom. The True Believers MCU Podcast, discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Television Universe. Union Federation, our Star Trek and the Orville Show. And we're proud to welcome the BQN Network to the Fandom Podcast Network. Please visit our friends on the BQN Network, a Star Trek Universe podcast that also includes your favorite topics, movies, history, superheroes, and more. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on YouTube. The Fandom Podcast Network is also on all major podcast platforms. 
Fandom Podcast Network audio master feed is on Podbean at fpnet.podbean.com. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. All right, great. Thanks so much, Kevin. Well, guys, we're going to have a little bit of a Star Wars top 10 list here for closing out this episode of the podcast with the 10 Star Wars characters with the highest kill counts. This is an article by Andrew Gladman over at CBR.com that just came out yesterday, August the 6th. Uh, so clearly he had the Star Wars beat, but there's not a lot to write about right now. So we're doing this uh, top 10 Star Wars kill count thing. Um, the idea is, in a franchise as vast as Star Wars, some truly destructive instances will stand out in audiences' minds. But there are also plenty of smaller wartime victories and defeats with plenty of casualties that may be easily overlooked. So, looking at on-screen kills alone, on-screen kills, which Star Wars character is the deadliest? So, coming in at number 10, guys, kicking us off, is the dude as part of the uh, the Bad Batch here on my shirt, Wrecker. So the unconventional but highly effective Clone Force 99 can probably be expected to have an impressive kill count between them. And he writes, it would probably come as no surprise to fans to learn that explosion-loving Wrecker has the highest kill count of the Bad Batch. However, it may be surprising to see his kill count is one of the highest in Star Wars narrowly beating Anakin Skywalker for a spot in the top 10. Now, here's where it gets interesting because Mr. Gladman has stats. Record oh. has somewhere around 350,000 kills to his name. The majority of those were not seen on the Bad Batch, but in his first appearance in The Clone Wars, when Anakin Skywalker allowed him to detonate the flagship of Separatist Admiral Trench. As it blew up, Trench's ship took out two other Separatist frigates. So there you have it. Now I wonder if uh, Mr. Gladman is assuming in this kill count when he keeps track of the you know total crew members of the Separatist fleet, do droids count as kills? Because there they, were they've tons of battle droids. To, yeah. to, to get to that those numbers, you've got to be counting the battle droids. There are just not that many meat creatures on Separatist ships. Meat creatures. <laughs> meat creatures. Meat I am a meat popsicle. Yes, indeed. Well, anyway, as a big fan of the Bad Batch and Clone Force 99, I think it's cool that Wrecker is on the list. And also, it's cool that we already know that Mr. Gladman's article here is going to be including the cartoons. Because as yes, we discussed yeah. earlier, this episode of the podcast, some people are like, ah, the cartoons don't count. That, <laughs> that means that Chopper's got to be on this list. Murder <laughs> droid that he is. <laughs> or R2 he, is, he, he is a cold blooded killer, I tell you. Well, cold oiled killer. Yes, yes. Derek, are you surprised to see Wrecker at the number 10 spot? Um, well, I mean, I I've as we go through this list, here's my my problem is is that you can just make up numbers of people, and again, it doesn't really matter to me because <laughs> well, I've never really seen these matters. people on screen right now. If you actually yeah. took the time and went through like people you actually see on screen, whether that's droids or Gungans or whatever you want to do, that's fine. Sand people, right? Um, and actually counted who killed what, that would have been more interesting. Whether it was through the movies, live action, the cartoons, mm -hmm. whatever, that to me would have been a lot better and more than just saying, well, according to Star Wars Index, there's 500 gazillion people on this ship and so-and-so blew up the ship. Like, what about all the yes. ships that I'm sure Anakin or, or or even probably they're not even considering Tarkin in this um, instance, if you go further down, uh, Tarkin's instance in the Clone Wars? Maybe so. But see, they, you're, you're sort of, give them yeah, one instance. You. Yeah, I agree <laughs> with you in that um, if you start saying so-and-so blew up this starship, and according to the Star Wars Encyclopedia, that starship has X number of crewmen, then you're going to have like really no-name rebel pilots who blew up ships in the Galactic Civil War. Yeah, oh, they wait, blew up look at number nine. <laughs> oh, look, number nine is no-name rebel pilot Arvel Crinard. 
Uh, Arvild Krenner is probably not a name known to many Star Wars fans, but he Unless played as a CCG important... fan. Yeah, that's where yes, I know it true. from. Uh, important, if leading role in Star Wars Episode Six: Return of the Jedi. Arvil is an A-Wing pilot in the Rebellion. During the Battle of Endor, after sustaining heavy damage, he flies his A-Wing straight into the bridge of the Executor, bringing down the Super Star Destroyer. Arvil's heroic sacrifice was delivered with an iconic final scream of defiance as he crashed into the Executor. He took out roughly 318,000 Imperial crew members, troops, and support staff who were on board the Executor. Okay, now I'm not 100% sure that this one should count because I don't think Arville was in control of his craft when he hit the yeah. executor. Yeah, the, the idea here seems to be that um, he made a, a kamikaze attack on the executor after had, the executor had been damaged. Um, I thought he was screaming like that because his A-Wing was spinning out of control and this was accidental. Now, granted, you could still say that his crash into the bridge is what caused all those people to die. Fine. But the way this paragraph is written, it makes it seem like he was aiming for the bridge. And I don't think that was happening at all. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I think he did. He was able to aim it with the situation and it was partly the force and the way the world works and all that stuff in our universe. And I think because of his expert flying, because they don't mention he is green leader. Um, so he's yeah. obviously a pretty good pilot, um, you know, but I feel like due to his situation, he knew he was dying because he got shot. So he was able to make that sacrifice. So I kind of agree with both of you. It's like, yeah, it was kind of a luck thing. But you could also say that about Luke Skywalker's proton torpedo. Oh, well, no, no, come on. No, no, no. That was definitely the will of force. That was the whole point. You did. You know what? Derek's over there going. And I'm over here going. Luke pulled a trigger. This guy went. Ah! Hey, he still had to steer it, though, because he could have gone completely I, side right. I he, thought he did not have his steering. But, you know, it's not super clear in the movie whether he has the ability to like steer spam. or not. Like, yeah, which, all, you know, I hear it's a good trick. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With it. Anyway, speaking <laughs> speaking of people who are fans of the Sky Guy, hey Derek, who's at number eight? Uh, let's see. Number eight, I have it pulled up here. Do, 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 uh, is Ahsoka Tano. So in this one, they An are a ranked character if there is one. <laughs> <laughs> so so apparently, is uh, they are counting droids because. And apparently only she's the only one that's ever killed droids. Like, I, I don't get this. I don't get this. Because this is saying, <laughs> while the while this, um, again, the second battle of Geonosis is seen in the episode weapons factory because uh, she destroys the battle droid factory, right? So it's like, oh, well, they wiped out 500,000 droids. Okay. Yeah, Maybe half he, of them weren't even finished built and operating yet. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Parts. He's saying while this mainly destroyed inactive battle droids who were not yet quote unquote yeah. alive and so cannot be considered kills it also wiped out plenty of active battle droids so this brings ahsoka's kill count to over five hundred thousand. that's a very yeah. weird <laughs> distinction to make there chief but okay yeah, sure. yeah and i on this one i don't understand how he got to the five hundred thousand. with the previous two you know he said you know this is how many of the crew are on these ships uh this number does feel pulled out of thin air. Yeah. <laughs> pulled out of somewhere yeah. else. <laughs> well, I wasn't yeah. going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyway, moving on. Uh, number seven, director Orson Krennic himself. The exact number of deaths by caused by Krennic's first Death Star blast is not known. The planet Jeddah had a population of over 11 million, but this test destroyed only a single city. The canon reference book Star Wars, The Rebel Files, described the death toll as being in the hundreds of thousands. So he might should be a little higher on the list, um, but certainly he deserves a spot on the list because he is responsible for, you know, blowing up the city of Jeddah. So there you have it. Um, Nathan, are you surprised that Krennic is not higher? Um, well, it really depends on how we're counting certain things. Uh mm -hmm. Because the Death Star laser gets shot off a couple other times, but not at Krennic's command. Right. I think this is the classic Krennic pulled the trigger, if you will, or gave the order. 
Yeah, so if we're only counting Jetta, then his position probably makes sense. After all, I'm sure Chopper is uh, in the several hundreds of thousands, so we still have to get to him. Yes. All right, well, anyway, speaking of how are you going to count the kills, and we're still dealing with a lot of capital Starship destruction here. Uh, Nathan, check out who has purple hair and is number six. It's... Admiral Holdo. Yes, with the infamous Holdo maneuver where she shot the Radis straight into uh, Supreme Leader Snoke's dreadnought, the Supremacy. Uh, it tore the Supremacy apart and also uh, damaged several Star Destroyers behind it. And I am definitely going to balk at this number. Uh, it's not known how many were killed on the Supremacy, but the other Star Destroyers alone give Holdo a kill count of around 1.6 million. I'm not sure those other Star Destroyers were completely destroyed. Um, yeah, they that's true. They certainly took several damage, but I'm not going to say that we can count all of the casualties on there. And several of them de demonstrably blew up, but several of them just sort of were like, ow, oh, we, you know, we were at 50% yeah. all. Right. Uh, and... and Looking at the supremacy itself, if you think about the number of characters on the supremacy that we know of that survived, it's almost all of them. Rose, Finn, Ray, Kylo. Uh, Snoke was dead, but not because of the Radis. Yeah, he was dead before that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hux survived. Phasma died moments later, but because she Finn died killed before. her, or not, yeah, right. Finn, Finn killed her, not Finn, not Finn killed her. BB-8, just fine. <laughs> the only character that we don't know might have been killed in that attack was DJ, because we don't see him after that. And even him, we're not sure. He may have gotten off. Uh, so really, when you look at it, that attack didn't kill that many people on the ship it hit, much less the ships behind it. I think it killed about 1.6 people, not 1.6 <laughs> million. That's the hold of maneuver good, for you. Yes, good. Yeah. Analysis. Pointless. The hold of maneuver, it, it sucks in it, all it, ways. All right, so. It, it was a distraction, and it was good at being a distraction, but all the people who say, oh, uh, if this works, then that... Uh, means that all space battles and all of Star Wars should have just been this. No, <laughs> this was not an effective technique for taking out the enemy. It was effective for making the enemy go, oh my gosh, we should concentrate on that and not those people escaping over there. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's move on to number five, a much more familiar and I think easily more... The true villain of Star Wars. <laughs> The true villain of Star Wars. What? Terrorist Supreme. No. Okay. Uh, Derek, who is number five, sir? It is our A-lister, Luke Skywalker. <laughs> That's right. Jedi Knight <laughs> Rebel Hero. Hero to who? Obviously not those that believe <laughs> in the <laughs> Empire. <laughs> <laughs> he was a terrorist. Uh I had friends on that Death Star. <laughs> radicalized by some religious... They were all just trying to do their job. Obi-Wan. Well, I could I mean, kill you, you with this how, If we all learn anything from, from, really, from Bad Batch, was that these poor people, other than, like, the high-level ranking people, and that's why they were high-ranking, but between Andor and, and um, Bad Batch... Most of those people didn't want to be there anyways. They were forced into it. It was basically mm -hmm. slavery. So really, the, even the 1%, which were the high-ranking officials that really believed in you know the almighty Palp, uh, the rest of them didn't want to be there. So they killed all those poor hotel workers, the janitors, the shoe chefs, all of them. Uh, Eddie For Izzard's uh, people in the, the, uh, the mess hall. Yeah, he killed with, all with the people the that were oppressed. Yeah, it's almost like war makes good people do bad things, and the I real know. villain is war, the war machine itself. Hmm. Anyway, well, that's why Luke said to... that he shouldn't have done anything, because he would have been better off. All those people wouldn't have been alive still. But however, that our our author here for this listicle does at least address this. So good on him. He's got the uh, stat here. Somewhere around 1.9 million people were on board the first Death Star when Luke destroyed it. Um, but 
it while there has been some debate over whether such an action can truly be justified had the rebellion not destroyed the death star it would have gone on to end countless more lives so, so in the grand calculus of the universe Luke has killed negative people it sometimes the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the oh see so you're going star trek i was going doctor strange Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I was also gonna go that if they actually had stopped the rebellion, maybe there wouldn't have been any more war. Now, nah, because I mean, there was war. There was plenty of war before the rebellion ever started. Just ask Count Dooku and the Separatists. Also, the em <laughs> the Empire didn't need war to bother killing people. They they did that yeah. anyway. Well, yeah. yes, yeah. but there would have been order. Maybe. Although perhaps some people say that well, trying to instill order is what caused the problems in the first place. Just let nature do its thing. The, the, there would not have been order after all. We had not yet gotten to the first order. And, and you can't have order without having the first order. Wait, no, I think I may have misinterpreted the name of this thing. Yes. All right, moving on. Number four. Let, speaking of people who blow up Death Stars... Um, following the destruction of the first Death Star, the Empire was quick to replace the weapon with a larger and more pro powerful second Death Star. And who do we call to blow that up? Why, Billy D... I mean, Lando Calrissian. Number four, <laughs> Lando Calrissian, who blew up Death Star 2 in Return of the Jedi. Although fully armed and operational, the second Death Star was incomplete at the time of its destruction, making it tricky to ascertain an exact kill count, according to Mr. Gladman here. However, it was considerably larger than the first Death Star, and its population during the Battle of Endor is listed at 2.4 million in the reference book Star Wars. Absolutely everything you need to know until somebody new buys it and retcons it all. Wait, that's not the title. My bad. Um, the title is in fact, Star Wars. Absolutely, I will everything argue this though because it wasn't only Lando pulling the trigger. Because you remember, Wedge if, Wedge had to pull mm -hmm. part of it for the mm -hmm. tower, and then yep, if Wedge had not blown up the um, power regulator, which Palpatine apparently installed, because he, he did learn from the first Death Star, that power regulator was there to stop chain reactions that happened in the first Death Star. So Wedge blowing up the power regulator is what set Lando up for the kill shot that actually blew up the Death Star too. Yep. So I, I think you should only get half credit. So 1.2 million people. Yep. And Wedge could have which the other 1.2 million, and they would yeah, be higher would up on the list. Which would put him yeah, behind but... Luke, yeah. Yeah, but they'd still be on the list. And, and according to this calculation behind Holdo, too, but um, I'm, I'm saying drop her out, put Wedge in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so moving on to uh, even more super weapons from the bad guys. Uh, Nathan, who do we have at numero trace? We have Allegiant General Pride, with a Y, but not where you'd expect it. Well, unless you <laughs> knew how to spell pride. Anyways, uh, this was a First Order Allegiant General, kind of the, the head honcho of the First Order's military. Underneath. Like Grand Admiral? It's very similar to a Grand Admiral, but an Allegiant General instead. Well, because he's uh, military, right? Versus a Navy. Well, he's he's ground instead of, of yeah. air. Right, yes, exactly. Right, right, right. Yes, uh, so he killed General Hux, so we're up to one. Uh, that's <laughs> And I'll give him that because that is on screen. And <laughs> that I is know the person. <laughs> that is definitely on screen, and we do know the person. Uh, he also sent uh, one of the Sith Eternals Zyton class star destroyers to Kajimi and had it destroy the planet. So we are getting up into destroying actual planets here, not just moon-sized space stations. Uh, mm -hmm. This uh, again, I'm not sure it killed everybody because who did we know on that planet who got off? Babu Frick. Babu Frick. Babu Frick was oh, fine. Sorry, sorry, Bliss. Yeah, yeah, but mostly Babu Frick. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we, we know it didn't destroy everybody on the planet, didn't kill everybody there, uh, but still, uh, that is estimated to be around 310 million people. Um, but you know, we, we got to estimate the population of a planet at this point. Um, that is a very rough figure, but still easily um, above everybody else we've gotten to on this list so far. And I expect at this point, we're only going to get people who destroyed entire planets perhaps multiple planets. 
Yeah. All right. And speaking of which, Derek, at number two, who do we have that also destroyed an entire planet? It is our Grand Moff Tarkin, um, where it says, obviously, from Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, he blows up Alderaan, Princess Leia's home planet. Uh, with this act of mass destruction, sounds like our modern war terms today, mm-hmm. Tarkin hoped to force Leia into giving up the rebel base, but only aimed to make the statement a political ploy for the power of the galaxy. Alderaan had a population of 2 billion at the time of its destruction until the release of Disney's Star Wars sequel trilogy. This action gave Grandma, Grandma of Tarkin the highest kill count of any Star Wars. But the problem is, though, Again, it doesn't give him credit for anything in the Clone Wars. It doesn't mm-hmm. give him the destruction of at Scarif, right? We know that mm-hmm. they didn't blow up yeah. Scarif, but there's obviously quite a few th- hundred thousand people, probably mostly, to be fair, mostly Imperials. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> including Trinic. <laughs> right, he nuked the whole garrison. I mean, yeah, there, was, yeah. there was like, what, maybe a handful of rebels down there at that point? <laughs> I mean, you, you could argue that the numbers were decreased by the infighting uh, right. on the planet itself. Really? Like, they're already dead. <laughs> yeah, most of them were. It was really just a handful and then, you know, Andor and, and Jin uh, at that point. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah but, but Tarkin was in the Clone Wars, too, as you pointed out. Um, so I'd have to go back. And he was and in charge of aerial ships. He blew up a lot of uh, yeah. What you call I, it, uh, I think the ships. I think the reason that's not counted here is because we didn't see him do that on screen. Uh, and at the beginning, it did mention on screen kill count. Uh, they didn't do anything in the Clone Wars. Come on, Mister Clone Wars. It's like well, they 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 rescued him from the Citadel, uh, and he was very much a non combatant in that series of episodes uh, okay did anything in bad oh, no. batch uh i think in bad batch he's mostly flying a desk same in rebels um we, right. we don't see him pulling a lot of triggers all right all right I yeah. thought we would have anyway, saw more in action. But anyway, you, you could also argue that kind of like with Krennic, you know, he, yeah, he gave the order, but he didn't push the button. Right. Um, you know. but he gave the order to terminate Leia's life or Leia, mm-hmm. as he pronounced it. Yes. Yeah. Although I maintain that all those guys with the black helmets on the Death Star that are flipping switches, uh, it's kind of like a uh, execution with the modern day uh, contemporary electric chair. You got like three dudes who are flipping the switch at the same time and they don't know which switch actually turns on the chair. That way they don't have to feel like, oh, no, I'm the guy that killed that guy. Right. Truly an executioner. Yes, exactly. Or sort of like the old firing squad where you got like five guys with rifles, but we don't know exactly which bullet killed the prisoner, right? And so I feel like all those dudes in the black helmets are flipping those switches and turning on those television channels, but only one of those buttons actually does something. They just don't know which button it was. See, I I think they didn't even tell them what they were doing. Just uh, We need you to turn on the lights on level 13. It's like, Which one are you sure? Back your button. <laughs> Boom. Well, we compacted some trash. That's right. Yeah. And we made the Death Star jump to hyperspace because not many people think about that, but the Death Star can travel at the speed of light. What? Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Aerodynamics don't mean anything in space. No, they Until do not. They do. Uh, okay. Well, anyway. Which is at the Battle of the Oven. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of uh, physics don't mean anything in Star Wars, we can either have the force or we can have physics. We can't have both. Um, The number one guy on this list had his super weapon defy all kinds of laws of physics and the way that light travels through space in the way that we understand it here in our own galaxy. Uh, And that is Mr. General Armitage Hux. So the guy in charge of the First Order and the guy in charge of ordering Starkiller Base to fire its primary weapon at the entire solar system of Hosnian Prime. It's because, you know, inflation. We can't just take out one planet. We got to take out the whole solar system. So in an act of war aimed at ending the reign of the New Republic, Hux ordered Starkiller Base to fire on the New Republic's then capital world of Hosnian Prime, along with the four other planets in the Hosnian system. The combined death toll for this action, which became known as the Hosnian Cataclysm, is believed to be around 
155 billion souls. This makes Hux directly responsible for far more deaths than any other character in Star Wars canon. Um, absolutely correct. And the whole point of showing us that on screen in episode seven was to, you know, really raise the stakes. But the whole beam of light going across multiple star systems, traveling light years of distance, and then somehow splitting itself into five different, almost like a multi warhead weapon, if you put it in Cold War terms, uh, a merv of a beam that then destroyed each of those planets. Um, it's just the physics behind that are just mind-bogglingly incorrect. Well, Although, and... like I always say, the physics in Star Wars Galaxy cannot work the same way as they do in our world because the dozens and dozens of things that we've seen well before the sequel trilogy couldn't possibly happen. Well, and the fact that Han saw it, it on a planet that's not even in the same solar system uh -huh. makes absolutely no sense. For for so many reasons. First off, how many light years are you away? That's how many years it should take before you can even see it. And there's no way you could see it with the naked eye. You'd have to have such a powerful telescope far beyond anything that we have on Earth today. So, yeah, physics uh, just stopped working at yeah. all yeah. there. <laughs> But the point of this list is how many kills you're responsible for. And if we're going with the, you gave the order to fire the super weapon, so you're responsible. Yeah, absolutely. Hux belongs to be at the top of this list. Unless you want to really split hairs and say Palpatine should be at the top of all the lists because whether it be in the form of Snoke or resurrected Palpatine or just regular old Palpatine, he told many of those dudes to tell the crewmen to fire the weapon. He told Tarkin mm -hmm. what to do. He told Allegiant General Pride what to do. He told Hux what Hux, to do. Yeah. yeah. So I did look it up. Um, Chopper's kill count is only around 50,000. <laughs> okay. 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 Well, first of all, uh, how is Chopper's kill count 50,000? And second of all, where did you find this? Um, uh, random <laughs> Googling. Okay, sure. It's but, awesome. But uh, it also involves um, being responsible for blowing up a, a couple of ships. Okay, sure. I'll accept that. Um, and, of course, estimating how many meat bags were on said ships. But, uh, <laughs> to, to his credit, to his credit, um, he did primarily kill actual living beings, not droids. Most of yeah. them were stormtroopers. But, uh, still. But, hey, Stormtroopers dying is a grand Star Wars tradition. Yes, it is. And speaking uh, of grand actually, Star Wars... Oh. I, uh, I have... <laughs> this actually has a list. A detailed list. Okay. Um, in the machine in the ghost, Chopper blows up a TIE fighter, so he kills a pilot. We're up okay. to one. <laughs> We're at one. <laughs> Uh, in the season one premiere, he blew up three more TIE fighters, so we're up to four. Uh, in episode four, he tries to kill Ezra, but is unsuccessful. <laughs> uh, in episode five, he blew up the leg of an ATDP, but that likely only resulted in non-fatal injuries. Uh, in episode 11, he committed cold-blooded murder against another astromech, then shoved its lifeless carcass into a sewer. <laughs> this is great um, in episode 13 he opened the airlock causing four stormtroopers to suffer a gruesome fate in the vacuum of space so we're up to 8 total kills so we are not counting the droid we're only up to 8 um, in the same episode he also pushed a completely innocent astromech out of the cargo hold completely unprovoked um, in season 2 episode 8 he turned off uh, turned gravity off and then on again causing three imperials to plummet to their deaths. He also tried to kill Ezra but again was <laughs> unsuccessful. <laughs> okay, I have to admit I don't remember all of these times where somehow <laughs> Chopper is trying to kill Ezra. I mean, I watched all of Star Wars Rebels some of it more than once. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to go back and watch those episodes just to see Ezra not quite die. Uh in the right. same episode, he also sabotaged the indicator in indictor uh causing it to explode and taking out two imperial cruisers down with it. Uh, the Indictor seems to have roughly the same size as an Imperial I-Class Star Destroyer, 
According to the wiki, those have 37,000 crew members and an additional 9,700 stormtroopers, which makes a total of just under 47,000 people. So that's, uh, add in the crew of the light cruisers, that's where you get to about 50,000 kills. Yes. The interdictor, because it interdicts the situation. Um, uh, apparently the I name... Uh, the name of that interdictor is Indictor, which that is not confusing right. as all. Yeah, that that's I think I think Dude Man may have misunderstood the script there. Uh, maybe. Anyway, well, good, good, good deep dive. Um, so yes, yeah, so destroying capital ships and counting all the crew members as kills is a grand Star Wars tradition. And speaking of Star Wars traditions, let's talk about what Star Wars T-shirts we're wearing this week. I'm gonna go first. I've got on. The Bad Batch, baby. Their little Queen tribute T-shirt that uh, that came out when their show was uh, first launched. I thought it was a cool idea to have the classic Queen album cover, but redone with the four main members of the Bad Batch. Uh, so, of course, uh, Echo is not included here. Neither is Omega, and this is before ye old betrayal by Crosshair. Dun dun. dun. Uh, Nathan, Spoiler alert! What do you what do you got on there? Well, I am running the 8-bit Grogu. This oh, is the way Mandalorian t-shirt. I love the old NES. I played so many NES games. Uh, my favorite was The Legend of Zelda, The Adventures of Link, which is widely regarded as one of the worst entries into the Legend of Zelda series. But it was my first, so I have a special place for it in my heart. So I love the 8-bit style. Uh, and you know, this combines Star Wars with 8 bit video games. How can you go wrong? Absolutely, just need to make it. Yes, yes that would an be awesome. 8 bit style, like Yoda's adventure kind of thing with Grogu. Well, what they could cool. do is they could basically take the Gremlins game, the Gremlins 2 game, where yes. you're instead of Gizmo, I, you're Grogu. I was thinking of just do a mod of the Super Star Wars, Super Empire Strikes Back, and Super Return of the Jedi games. Because back then, video games were hard. I'm about to say, that would make it a really hard video game. <laughs> yeah, and, and not uh, because they necessarily intended games to be hard. Just because they were poorly made sometimes. They, they were. It's like You, you right. have to jump on this one specific ledge. There's no indication that you need to do that. And you can and you only make sure do this <laughs> pixel-perfect jump. You can't see it. Yeah, you, you can't, can't see it, it until you make the jump. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck, sir. All right, Derek, what Star Wars t-shirt do you have on this week, bro? Well, I've got something new. Not tonight, though. I'm saving it for our oh. premiere of Ahsoka. But I've got this classic. Pew, 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 With a little more pew, 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 pew. <laughs> yep. So yes, good times. Um, but good I've, got a, I've got a cool thing I got from her universe um, last week. Came in the mail this week already. Uh, or maybe it was Friday. Uh, but uh, anyways, yeah, so uh, I'll be ready to wear that when we have our premiere for Ahsoka. Rock on. And of course, we'll be announcing when we're going to do um, kind of our live stream, live reactions to Ahsoka, as it were. Uh, so stay tuned to all the various social medias. Uh, but first, if you guys want to get your own cool What a Piece of Junk t-shirt or pillow or mouse pad or coffee mug or whatever, please head over to our Tee Public store over at tpublic.com and search up Fandom Podcast Network in the search bar. Uh, Derek, where can people find us out there on the internet, sir? So Podbean is the master feed, so head on over there. But you can download us or stream us off of any major platform like Spotify, Apple, Google, or the iHeartRadio. And again, anywhere you can get podcasts, you can hit us up. Um, we'd appreciate it. Um, it's really good. Any of the great stuff that uh, Kevin talked about earlier, too, you can find us all under the uh, FPNet uh, master feed. So and uh, obviously when you're there and you hit our you know um items to download or you know to stream us obviously hit the subscribe button so you can get all the notifications of when it is you can also go over to the youtube page um and hit us up there uh as scott talked about so and nathan um you know when they're there and they download us or stream us what should they also do they should also leave us a great review because that does three things one, it lets us know what we're doing well and what we're not doing well and how we can better serve you in your Star Wars journey. 
Two, it helps other people find our podcast so that they can share in with what a piece of junk. Three, well, uh, we just talked about a whole bunch of Star Wars characters who killed a whole bunch of people. And uh, I hear that uh, giving us reviews will uh, help stop them from coming and finding you. Indubitably. So, yes, please give us a good review out there, folks. We want to thank you for joining us for this episode. We're all counting down to Ahsoka series premiere, so stay tuned for when we're going to talk about that. But please always let us know how we can make the show better or if you really liked something about the show because we do this to entertain you guys and to entertain ourselves, let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, But we certainly want to thank you all for joining us. And please always remember to respect each other and respect each other's fandom. All right, Nathan, punch it.